Okay, hello students. My name is Braden Evans and I'm an entomologist and I'm here to talk to you about insects and their diversity today. I think uh, I've got some fun stuff in store for you and I hope you're having a great time at the Virtual Environment Day for the PVMCC School Board. I'm a professor at Fleming College at the Frost Campus. I teach everything from ecosystem skills to uh, aquatic ecosystems to even uh, natural resource economics. So all kinds of topics, but my true love and my true passion is insects. And so I hope to be able to give you a little bit of some of my passion, share that with you today. Um, so let's dig in here, all right? Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the importance of biodiversity. That might be a term you guys know, maybe you've never heard it before, but we'll talk about it. It's very important when we think about environmental issues. And talk a little bit about entomologists. So entomologists are insect scientists, that's what I am. Tell you a little bit about what we do. Uh, I'm going to talk about that, the specific part of entomology that I work in, biological control. And then I'm going to show you all kinds of really cool photos and tell you why insects are the coolest. So I hope to be able to convert some of you guys into insect lovers uh, by the time we're done today. All right. So first, biodiversity. What is that exactly? Uh, it's, you know, the, the, in, the diversity means like the number and the variety of living organisms, that's the bio part, that means living organisms, around the planet or even in ecosystems like our backyards or uh, a pond or a lake or a swamp in a nearby area, okay? Any given environment has a certain biodiversity and it's really important. And along with climate change, the loss of biodiversity is really considered to be the most important environmental issue around the world today. Those are the two big ones, climate change and biodiversity loss. Why should we care? Why should we care if we start losing biodiversity, we start losing species and species go extinct? Well, you know, we've currently described, scientists have talked about and looked at about almost 2 million species of plants and animals around the world. But did you know that there's another 80%, that's only 20%, there's another 80% out there that we haven't even had a chance to look at yet. Deep in the jungles, um, rainforests, the Amazon, um, underwater canyons, um, deep water blue holes, there's all kinds of places that we haven't explored yet. So we should be concerned that we might lose some species before we ever get to know them, right? We also know, you know, there's some people out there who crunch some numbers. We found that 40% of the world's economy, our jobs, our businesses, relies on biodiversity. And 80% of the needs of the poor people around the world uh, are met with biodiversity as well. So that can be anything from the timber and lumber that we get from trees, um, the fish that we eat, um, and any number of other, um, you know, living organisms in our ecosystems that help us, help us earn our living, gain our living, or subsist our lives, right? Um, now, there are a lot of things that a healthy level of biodiversity does for us, okay? In the ecosystems around us, we call them ecosystem services. They're natural services. They're things we get for free from nature. They keep, you know, having good biodiversity keeps our water resources clean. Um, they keep our soils rich in nutrients and keep them, prevent our soils from eroding away and blowing away in the wind. Um, they keep nutrients stored in our environment. So things that plants and animals feed on are there. Uh, healthy ecosystems with high biodiversity help break down pollution. They keep the climate stable and predictable. They help us recover when we have a big storm come through. Trees uh, help shelter us from wind, all right? They protect our homes 
protect uh, us from flooding. There's all kinds of resources we also get from biodiversity. So food, medicines, wood, um, breeding stocks of animals. So some of us maybe live in rural areas. Maybe we have a farm or our neighbor has a farm. Maybe we keep some animals at home. Biodiversity helps support that, okay? And then of course, for those of us who like to get outside, having rich biodiversity allows a guy like me to go fishing or to go insect collecting and do all the things that I like to do in the outdoors and maybe some of you like to do as well, all right? So biodiversity is really, really, really important. Now, here's something that you may not know. Of all of the animals in all of the world, when we count up the total number of species, all right, let's take a look here. We've got about 6,000 species of amphibians, that's frogs and toads and salamanders and things like that, right? Um, we've got almost 10,000 species of birds, 30,000 species of fish, 5,000 species of mammals, but almost 1 million species of insects. So if you were to split the whole animal kingdom into a pie, everything else falls into this category. And this is insects, okay? So insects versus the rest of the animal kingdom, that's about three quarters of the pie. That's what people don't really realize, right? We have such diversity of insects. That's the number of different species, not the number of individuals, like, you know, there's a million ants in a giant ant colony. No, no, this is 950,000 different species of insects. That's a lot of insects, am I right? Okay, so that's something that I think a lot of us don't realize because when we flip on, you know, Netflix or put on our favorite channel with a nature show. We don't always see insect shows. What do we see? We see shows about tigers. We see shows about pandas, koalas. Those are all beautiful animals. They're important animals. They play an important role in ecosystems, right? But what I'm telling you is that there are more insect species and all of the mammals, all of the birds, all of the reptiles, all of the amphibians, all of the fish, all the spiders, all the scorpions, all of the mollusks, all of the crustaceans and corals and flowering plants and all the plants and ferns and trees and mosses and algae and mushrooms and everything combined, yes, fact, all right? There are more species of insects than all other living life forms. Um, so that's kind of news for people, right? A lot of people are like, really? I didn't think of that, right? And I knew there were a lot of individual insects around the world, but I didn't know that there were uh, such, a, such a variety of insect species. All right, so I told you guys, I'm an entomologist. That means I'm an insect scientist, right? So what do I do? Well, I like when, you know, some big beetles land on my face or I like having these little walking sticks walking around on my arm. But we actually do a lot of different things in a lot of different areas, okay? There are medical entomologists that deal with biting flies that transmit diseases in some parts of the world, like mosquitoes that transmit a disease like malaria, right? There are forensic entomologists when there's a case uh, to be solved, who sometimes use insects to help them solve cases. Detectives, police detectives work with entomologists. There's veterinary entomologists. So if you have some pets at home or some livestock at home, uh, there could be insects that cause problems for some of our, the animals that are near and dear to our hearts. We have entomologists to help with that problem. Uh, we have forest entomologists. So when there's uh, an outbreak of caterpillars that are eating the trees in the forest, the leaves in the trees in the forest, there's forest entomologists to help solve those problems. And then there's agricultural entomologists. That's what I am. So I work with farmers um, when there's problems with insects in the, in the fields and um, fruit and vegetable fields. I help them solve those problems with um, by looking at how to manage insect populations. And I'll tell you about that in a bit. 
the coolest thing about being an entomologist is you get to travel around for your work. I spent two years down in Florida in the strawberry fields. Here I am with a couple of my my pals working away on some insects in the strawberry fields. Um, and I've been all over the United States um, tracking down insect problems and trying to help help farmers solve them. And the area, the specific thing that I do is called biological control. That might be a new term for most of you, okay? Um, it's using ecosystems, okay, to solve insect problems. So you guys may have heard that, you know, sometimes when someone's trying to grow some fruits and vegetables, um, they spray a pesticide, right? They might spray some chemical to kill the insects, right? But more and more, we're trying to find different ways of, um, you know, preventing insects from eating up our crops. And we don't always want to spray a chemical pesticides. So another thing we can do is use insects against insects. And that's what I do. And that's what biological control is. So you can see here, these are what we call biological control agents. This guy here, the ladybug eating up an aphid. So if a farmer's having an aphid problem on his corn crop, right? And he's got aphids kind of spreading out throughout his corn and um, he or she, uh, you know, is concerned that the corn's gonna get eaten up by the bugs. They can call someone like me. It's gonna go out, have a look and say, hey, you should get some ladybugs in here. And they can actually buy ladybugs, put them in their field and help control some of those aphids. They'll eat up some of those aphids and keep them from doing some damage. Same thing with this guy. This one, this might be a little bit, you might find this a little bit strange or a little bit, uh, a little bit gross. <laughs> but this is a wasp called a parasitoid and it actually lays eggs inside of other insects and the baby wasp will actually eat up the insect um, and kill it from the inside. So kind of tough for that one insect, but it helps, it really helps farmers who have problems with um the you know some insects on their on their crops so let's see here just need to sorry i gotta bring up there we go okay um so that's what i do so i deal with these guys called biological control agents now is that the same thing as like an fbi agent no right these are biological control agents and uh they're involved in keeping insect numbers down in agricultural fields, okay? Now, there's all kinds of different biological agents out there. There's predators, like this guy here. This is a stink bug, the one on top, all right? And that stink bug is feeding on the larva of um, a pest insect called a Colorado potato beetle. So that's helping farmers out. This guy here, this is a really cool fly called a robber fly, and it can catch things like moths and stuff in flight. it will catch them right out of the air and eat those up so it keeps them from doing some damage to our fruit and vegetable crops. This little beauty is called a tiger beetle. And where I work in Lindsay, we've got loads of these out right now flying around, eating up some insects that cause problems in agricultural crops. This one here, give you a second to look at it you won't believe it but that's actually the larva of a ladybug so before an, a ladybug becomes an adult that's what they look like and they are a notorious predator of aphids and aphids are little tiny bugs like the one right in front of his face there um, that cause all kinds of problems for uh, uh, fruit and vegetable growers so ladybugs are a big plus they're really good to have in our ecosystems and uh, even ladybug larvae, the larva, looks like that, okay? And it helps out with the aphid problems. These guys are called surfid flies or flower flies. They're really cool because they imitate bees. They're harmless. They can't sting you, but they actually have the same coloration as bees so that if a bird's coming in to eat it, um, they might go, oh, wait a minute, that's a bee, and fly away. So that's called mimicry. They're mimicking uh, bees and wasps, but they're actually totally harmless to us. But their larvae are like that ladybug larva, and their larvae will eat up all kinds of aphids and other problem insects in agricultural fields.
All right, and there's one right there eating up an aphid. That is that worm looking thing. That's a, the larva of a flower fly or a surfid fly. Okay, um, and then we've got these guys here, lace wings, nice little guys whose uh, larvae also feed on aphids. Okay, so in addition to those predators that are biological control agents, we also have parasitoids. Okay, so that's like that wasp I showed you earlier. These little tiny wasps, they don't really look like the wasps that we're used to seeing, the yellow jackets and the paper wasps that make, you know, hives and nests around our homes and try to get at our, our food sources sometimes when we're having lunch outside on the, in the backyard and they'll come after our, our lunch. Um, these guys are different. They're tiny. And what they do is they lay their eggs in other insects. And so their other insects end up being where their the baby wasps end up growing up. And they kind of eat their way out of it. It's kind of gross, but really cool at the same time. Okay. So here's one here. This is called an ichneumonid wasp. It's actually going to lay its egg inside of a beetle larva, which is inside of a tree. So it'll actually work its little stinger there through the wood and drop an egg inside of an insect that could be causing uh, some damage to our forest ecosystems. Here's another little tiny guy. This is called a chalcid wasp. Does the same kind of thing. Here's a chalcid laying eggs inside the eggs of uh, some problem insects. All right. And then in addition to the parasitoids, we have pathogens. So pathogens are like diseases of insects that can uh, help us uh, control uh, outbreaks, right? When we have insect outbreaks in agricultural fields, there's these fungus, okay? These are called entomopathogenic fungus. It's a big mouthful, but what it is, it's, it's a disease that will end up killing the insects without having to use chemical sprays. And this disease is totally harmless to humans. It only affects insects, okay? There's another one there. And then we have nematodes. Nematodes are these little worms Sometimes people use them on their lawn. You can throw them, sprinkle them on your lawn and they'll go through the soil and they'll eat up some of the insects that eat up our lawns. So a lot of beneficial insects out there that uh, we use as biological control agents. There's some more nematodes eating up a, uh, a caterpillar, okay? Um, and they can really do good for us when we have you know, insect outbreaks that are kind of spinning out of control. Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that we're starting to eat more and more insects every day? We're having insect protein powder, insect bars, and even just fresh roasted insects. It's amazing. People all around the world have been doing this for a really long time. And finally, over here in North America and Canada and the US, people are starting to realize, well, you know what? Eating insects is actually kind of good for the environment. And it's kind of good for our health too. How about that? How do you like that burger there? It's a cricket burger made with those uh, roasted crickets. And um, you know, we realize that actually they're almost all protein, okay? So they're good for you. They've got more calcium than milk. They've got more protein than beef, uh, more iron than spinach lots of vitamin B and et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. So might seem gross to you right now, but who knows? Maybe one day we'll all be eating lots of insects all the time. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I've told you guys a little bit about biological control, entomology. I'm just going to get into some really cool stuff that insects do for another five minutes or so before I let you go today. All right. Um, I just want to give credit to this gentleman, Alex Wild. He's this amazing insect photographer and he makes his photos. He's, he's based in the U.S. and he makes his photos available uh, for free um, to, to educators around the world. So I'm appreciative that um, he lets me use his amazing photos to do talks like this one. Okay. All right. First up, I'm going to give you guys five seconds. Take a guess at what insect that is. It looks like an earwig, maybe. It does look like an earwig, but it's not. That's actually a beetle. It's called a rove beetle. And it's different from almost all other beetles because it's got only half of a shell, right? 
most beetles have a full sort of covering all the way over their abdomen here. They kind of look like turtles, right? They got like a, a turtle shell or sometimes we call it a carapace. Well, this is a beetle that's adapted to have really short wings and you get to see his abdomen, his, his back end. Um, and uh, most people don't know. We've got these around us all the time and most people don't realize that that is a species of beetle, a group, a whole family of beetles actually called the rove beetles. Okay, here's a cool thing that insects do. Maybe you'll find this kind of gross, kind of strange, but I think it's phenomenal, all right? This is what we call a hyperparasitoid, okay? Now, let me paint the picture for you here, okay? This guy here is an aphid that has had a parasite come up and drop an egg inside of them, a parasitoid, okay? So a, a, a wasp has already parasitized this aphid. So this guy, unfortunately, is dead, okay? And there's a baby wasp growing inside, okay? Now, what this wasp does is it parasitizes the parasite. So it targets these aphids that have already been parasitized and it'll lay its egg inside the wasp that's growing inside of the aphid. It's pretty wild. Um, I've been losing, I'm losing my clicker here, guys. Bear with me. Let's see, there it is. There. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's hyperparasitism, and it's pretty wild. So this little wasp here is not even interested in the healthy aphids all around it. It just wants to attack the aphid that has a baby wasp inside of it. Pretty weird, right? How about this? This is called kleptoparasitism, and this involves um, stealing the food from other insects. And that's exactly what this fly does. This is called an ant mugging fly, and it literally pins ants down, okay? When ants are walking around, you guys have probably seen ants before they walk around with big bundles of food, right? This little fly will sneak up on an ant, pin it down, force it to spit out its food, take it and fly away quickly before the ant buddies come up and try to attack the fly, okay? So that is called a kleptoparasite. And what that means is it steals food from other insects. And in this case, this is an ant mugging fly that steals food from ants. All right, there are some beautiful little ambush predators. And we've got these guys all over the Kawartha Lakes area in and around Peterborough in that region. Um, they are called ambush bugs. And pretty interestingly, sometimes you might be walking through a field of goldenrod, that yellow flower on the left. It's really common, it's all around us. Next time you see some overgrown grassy fields, you'll take note of this, okay? And you can walk through that goldenrod and you'll see it's really good. Goldenrod is really good for pollinators. There's butterflies and bees and wasps all around feeding on the nectar of those flowers. And every once in a while, you look over and you'll see there's like a dead bee or a dead wasp hanging off a goldenrod flower. You go, what is that? And then you come up and look a little more closely and you realize this cute, cuddly little ambush bug can actually take down a wasp or a bee twice its size. It sits there in ambush, ready to pounce. And when a bee or a wasp comes by, it'll grab it. So that's something you can commonly see in and around uh, in and around your community. So take a look this summer, maybe in June, July, and August, we'll have more of them out there, all right? Okay, here's another interesting fun fact about insects. They can actually shoot burning acid to protect themselves from predators. This is called a blister beetle, and if you picked one up, there's not too many of them here in Ontario, but they are all around North America. Um, it could shoot burning acid out of its rear end to leave a bit of a burn mark. You can actually feel a little mild burn, right? And if you can imagine if that's a dog or a cat, you know, some little animal that picks something like that up in their mouth and it shot that burning acid, that animal would right away would drop it and bleh, spit that out. So that's kind of a cool defense against predators, right? Um, okay, now another aspect of insects that's super cool, different life stages have different habits. So this is a little lacewing here. 
beautiful little guy, the, the green one on the right there, that's an adult, okay? So that's what they look like when they're, when they're adults. And it'll feed on nectar and pollen, on flowers, that kind of thing. The larva has a completely different life. This larva here, you can see it's got great big fangs and it's feeding on, that's actually a ladybug larva. So it'll eat anything that, you know, that it can fit in between those fangs. Um, so it's a voracious predator while this other one is just like kind of a gentle pollinator. So same, same animal, same species, but when it's a larva, it has a totally different life than when it's an adult. Okay, here's another super cool fact. Maybe some of you have witnessed this before. This is a mayfly emergence. Mayflies, like this guy here in the photo, they only live as adults for like one or two days. They spend one or two years in the water as aquatic larvae, okay? And then somehow, based on the day length, and temperature, and all these conditions being right, they all come out at exactly the same time to reproduce, lay their eggs, and then die, okay? That's the life of a mayfly. So here you can see in some images, when that happens, in some of our towns around like some bigger lakes, you get swarms, huge swarms. They're covering the Pepsi machine and the ATM here. They cover up cars and houses and storefronts. And actually here I've got an image that was picked up on radar. I think it was in the U.S. in Wisconsin um, where that's a mayfly hatch. And the mayflies were so numerous and abundant that um, the radar picked up their body heat signatures. So pretty wild, right? Talk about lots of insects and talk about synchronizing your timing. You've only got one or two days as an adult. So you, you, if you want to find a mate, you find, want to find somebody to, to hat, lay some eggs with, you, gotta, you, you all need to get out of the water at the same time. And that's what they do. Okay, a little bit gross, but yeah, they eat each other. Not just eat each other but eat the same species. So when we have, uh, you know, food shortages, maybe it hasn't rained in a while, we got a bit of a drought, or maybe the season's ending and there's not so many grasses around, insects will turn on each other like that. So they're pretty vicious. Even the cuddly caterpillars, you know, you think, oh, they just feed on leaves. They're herbivores, right? They don't feed on meat. Well, there's no leaves around. They go for the next best thing, even if it's their brother. Thankfully, we don't do that. Okay, here's another thing that I pointed out a little earlier, but this is a great example. So um, mimicry and warning coloration. So take a look. These two images on the right, those are wasps, okay? But take a good look at the one on the left. There's something a little different. It's got its legs up like this and a head kind of shaped like a praying mantis, okay? We call these guys mantispids or mantis flies. They're they, they, they resemble praying mantises in some ways. But this one here is totally harmless. And it imitates these wasps. And if you look at, the, look at them without looking too closely, you can see how they would really throw off a predator, right? So if a bird wants to come in and eat it, it'll think twice because it, it knows that, you know, a wasp can sting you and leave you with a sore mouth. So that's what this little guy's doing here, so, uh, mimicking wasps. All right, then we've got these cuddly little cuties. These are called velvet ants, but they're actually wasps. We call them ants, but they're wasps that have lost their wings. The males have wings and the females don't, okay? They're pretty cute when you look at them, right? Um, but they've got one of the most painful stings in all uh, of all insects okay so you don't want to handle these guys with bare hands and they actually parasite their parasite sites of bees and wasps so they'll catch a bee or a wasp and lay an egg inside of it and their their uh, uh the baby the velvet ant will grow up inside of that so kind of gross kind of uh fearsome but extremely adorable if you look at them from a distance right here's another example of mimicry, right, where we're copying some other um, species. These are uh, surfid flies, flower flies, like the ones I showed you earlier on, but they're imitating different species of uh, bees and wasps that 
could be, you know, potentially a threat for a, a predator like a bird. So that helps protect them. Things don't want to eat them as much if they look like a wasp, right? Or if they look like a bee. All right. And then something that you don't see every day, but we do have them around us. We've got these surprising and rare color morphs. So this is a what's called a longhorn grasshopper. They're also called katydids, okay? And um, typically they look like this one on the right, the bright green, and they live in the foliage and the trees. But every once in a while, you get some that come out pink. And especially down in southwestern Ontario, down in the Windsor area, we get quite a few of these. So pretty cool if you're out for a walk at night, sometimes shine your light on something and you see something like that. Uh, you don't think of pink insects as being so abundant and common in Ontario, but we've got them. So there's a lot going on under our noses that we don't necessarily think about, you know. So hopefully in my talk today, I've been able to convince you that insects are pretty cool. If you are interested in them, there's so much to learn and it's not a big investment, right? You can get yourself a field guide, even get it from the local library if you want. Um, try to score a butterfly net. You could even get one from Dollarama and just go for a walk. Go sit outside and observe for a little while. It's amazing how uh, how much diversity and interesting life you get to see when you just kind of get out there and, and observe a little bit. So anyway, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to say thank you so much uh, for the invitation to come talk to you guys today. I hope you're having a great time, and I'm really proud to hear that you're having um, an environment day, even though we're doing it virtually. It's still important to talk about the environment. Hopefully I, got, I convinced you guys to love insects just a little bit more um, and you learned a few things today. All right, so take care everybody and um, have a great environment day. Bye for now.